material left to cover today is the last session before the uh, before the exam. So what I'm going to do is, if a particular uh, part of the test text is pretty straightforward, I'll just indicate that. If there's nothing I want to add to it, I'll just say okay, and we'll move on to the next section. Okay. I want to make sure we, we, we cover all the stuff. Okay, so we're on to page 22. Um, the the, the right-hand column at the top, vascular disease outside the heart, peripheral arteries, and aorta. I think their treatment of the section that deals with uh, embolism, uh, emboli is, is straightforward, so I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, we'll scroll down to... We'll scroll down to... Um, Uh, peripheral vascular disease, um, and uh, I am actually their treatment of that is also pretty good. I just want to do. I did want to direct your attention to this slide, this is slide 25 in the handout, which uh, goes into a little bit more detail about the, the actual molecular mechanism or the, the, the cellular mechanisms of uh, atherosclerosis. So you might want to uh, take a look at that as it relates to peripheral vascular disease and uh, atherosclerosis of the aorta. Um, all right. Uh, the, um, the, the section on atherosclerosis of the aorta, they do talk about a couple of different uh, uh, causes of it. Uh, usually it's, it's atherosclerotic in etiology, but they do mention Eladonol syndrome and Marfan syndrome. And uh, just a little bit of background on Marfan syndrome. Uh, Marfan syndrome, we've alluded to it before. It, it, it involves connective tissue abnormalities. The genetics is uh, autosomal dominant. I think we talked about that before. Patients that have Mar Marfan syndrome can have uh, problems with their eyes, with the uh, uh, cardiovascular system, and with the skeletal system. They, have, they can have ectopia lentis, so the displacement of the lens in the eyes. They're prone to the development of mitral valve prolapse, okay, the so-called click murmur syndrome. Um, most patients can have a, 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 a mid-systolic click associated with a murmur. Uh, they're prone to the development of uh, aortic uh, aneurysms or dissection. Those are patients with Marfan syndrome, that is. Uh, the, the thumb sign, so patients, anybody have Marfan syndrome? <laughs> the Marfan syndrome, they can bend their thumb back and touch the back of their hand, which is pretty, pretty uh, impressive. Um, uh, and um, they have the spider fingers known as arachnodactyly, and their arm span, arm span, their wingspan is greater than their height. Okay, they're also prone to the development of uh, pectus, uh, pectus abnormalities, pectus excavatum, etc. Paranatum. Okay. Um, The section on aortic, the, the section on aortic dissection, I think, is also uh, straightforward. So I'm not going to add anything to that. Um, okay, let's turn our attention to the section on lipid lowering drugs, uh, the lipids and lipid lowering drugs, and you have a couple of things. I, uh, the, the, the diagram in the text. Although they tried to simplify it, it's kind of it's a little bit confusing. So what I did is I added this one uh, from another text. You can take a look at that one. Uh, you can also take a look at the one I added to your slides um, and see which one you find more elucidating. It looks like this. I, I, it should be slide number two. Okay, um, and we'll go through this briefly to try and uh, make some sense out of it. Uh, and again, I direct your attention to the uh, to the other slides that I told you about, which I think are a little bit clearer. Um, but uh, basically, what's happening? <coughs> what's happening is if you look at um, um, actually. Let's see. Bef before we talk, let's go a little bit order that the text covers it. So let's talk first about um, about Figure One Twenty One. So let's look at Figure One Twenty One. Uh, and you can divide the cholesterol metabolism up uh, into, into two pathways. You have an exogenous pathway and you have an endogenous pathway. The exogenous path pathway is all about dietary uh, dietary cholesterol. Okay, 
So what you see happening in the exogenous pathway is that uh, the uh, dietary fats are absorbed through the small intestine in the form of uh, chylomicrons, which are rich in uh, cholesterol and triglycerides. And these chylomicrons are acted on by the uh, enzyme lipoprotein lipase on the uh, cell surface of the adipose tissue and muscle tissue. And those tissues extract triglycerides. Uh, and so then you have a cholesterol rich remnant, a chylomicron uh, remnant, uh, which uh, returns uh, after being, again, after being acted on by lipoprotein lipase, is, is, is brought to the liver. Okay, and you see that's depicted uh, in, um, in, in figure 121. That's the exogenous pathway. And again, it's all about getting triglyceride to the peripheral, to the adipose tissue and, uh, and cholesterol uh, to the liver. Then you have the endogenous pathway. And in the endogenous pathway, uh, what's happening, you see it begins with the uh, production of DLDL, very low density lipoproteins of the liver, and you can think of them as the analog or the equivalent of the chylomicrons, because you see that they can, they contain uh, cholesterol and triglycerides. Okay, so just as the chylomicrons were acted <coughs> on by lipoprotein lipase, the uh, VLDL are also going to be acted on by lipoprotein lipase, and that is going to again, uh, release triglycerides, which is going to be used by peripheral cells. And the IDL, which is left behind, the intermediate density lipoproteins, are basically the same as, you can think of them as DLDL remnants, okay? They're like the chylomicron remnants. They're, they're a cholesterol-enriched remnant, a triglyceride-impoverished remnant, however you want to think about it, okay? Um, the uh, IDL as you can see, uh, part of it goes uh, is goes back to the liver, is acted on by uh, hepatic lipase, and turned into low density li lipoprotein. And the low density lipoprotein <coughs> can be taken up by either LDL receptors in the liver or LDL receptors in the peripheral tissues. Okay. The third, the third pathway that you have to be aware of, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's got nothing to do with uh, uh, getting cholesterol to the periphery, but it's about getting cholesterol back to the, to the liver so that it can be uh, metabolized and excreted, uh, is the pathway that involves HDL. And so uh, what happens, if you see that the, that the HDL, HDL particles, high density lipoprotein particles, uh, are produced both by the, uh, the uh, bowel uh, as well as by the liver. And those HDL particles are going to interact with uh, the uh, chylomicron <coughs> and are going to uh, interact with the intermediate density lipoprotein, or uh, sorry, uh, very low density lipoproteins. Uh, and they're going to be converted into mature HDL, and that mature HDL is going to be transported back to the liver. So these are uh, lipoproteins bearing, bearing uh, uh, cholesterol being transported back to the liver so that the, the cholesterol can be uh, metabolized and excreted. So LDL, if you look at the, again, if you look at the diabetes, whatever diagram you look at, what you'll see is that uh, LDL uh, is about getting uh, cholesterol uh, out to the periphery, and the higher your LDL, uh, the worse your, uh, your cardiovascular uh, situation. HDL is all about getting the cholesterol from the periphery back to the liver so that it can be metabolized and excreted. And so that's why HDL is, uh, is considered favorable, high HDL is considered favorable, uh, high LDL is considered unfavorable. A 
couple more uh, points about the, the transport of the hepatic uh, lipids. Just to clarify about the uh, the the IBL, remember the VLDL is metabolized by lipoprotein lipase to IBL. Uh, and I told you that IBL is then taken up by the liver. Uh, apparently, the liver removes uh, approximately 40 to 60 percent, half of those, of those VLDL remnants. Uh, the remainder is remodeled by hepatic lipase to form LDL. So 50 percent is removed, 50 percent is remodeled to LDL. And we told you the story uh, about LDL. Um, the cholesterol in the LDL accounts for about 70% of plasma cholesterol. Thank you. Question. Again, the reason the pathways are called exogenous endogenous, there's a couple of different ways for cells to get cholesterol. Cells need cholesterol for cell membranes, okay? They need it for their membranes. The cells can either synthesize them, okay, and that's where the, the whole H, HMG CoA reductase enzyme and the pathway that's associated with it comes in. Uh, they can also get it exogenously through the bowel. So you can think of it as uh, exogenous is uh, sort of imported uh, cholesterol and then. Uh, the, uh, the endogenous is all about domestic uh, cholesterol from the standpoint of the cell. All right, um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the, uh, some of the drugs. They, their treatment is okay. They mentioned um, the treatments associated with the exogenous pathway, and they mentioned azetamib, which is uh, the, the brand name is Zetia, Z E T I A. Azetamib, Zetia, and this is an inhibitor of cholesterol absorption, blocks cholesterol absorption uh, by the bowel. Another one that, that, that you've probably seen advertised more on TV uh, is a drug called Vitorin, V-Y-T-O-R-I-N. Uh, Vitorin is equal to Azetamib, or Zetia, plus Simvastatin, okay? So it's got, it's got two agents in it. The, the azetamib is responsible for blocking cholesterol inhibition through the bowel, but the simvastatin is responsible for blocking cholesterol biosynthesis by the HMG CoA reductase uh, pathway. And so that's the commercial that says, you know, you can get, you can get you, some people have high cholesterol because of their aunt, and some people have it because of, you know, their, whatever they're eating, whatever. So, uh, it's, it, it, it addresses both the genetic and the, and the dietary uh, components. So that's a Vitorin, which is a, a combination drug of Azetamib and Simvastatin. A couple of other things. Um, Mentioned the, uh, just to clarify about the, the receptors in the, in their simplified uh, uh, figure 121, they, they depict LDL receptors as being present on the surface of the liver cells. Actually, LDL receptors are present on uh, the surface of all nucleated cells, but most <coughs> most of the receptors are in the liver. 70% of the LDL receptors uh, are in the liver. All right. Vasculitis. Vasculitis is, is a uh, is an uh, in, interesting but a, a complicated topic. Remember, I told you that if you understand vasculitis, you, you understand medicine. That's one of the one of the uh, things that that's true about. Um, so what I'm going to do is just 
uh, uh, try and clarify it and, and, and uh, just uh, and, and add a little bit, uh, supplement a little bit what the book talks about uh, with, with regard to vasculitis. Um, so in terms of um, the, the, uh, the approach to vasculitis, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to talk about each of the uh, vasculitic syndromes or highlight some of the vasculitic syndromes on page 25. But to give you an overall approach to the patient that presents with the vasculitis, the suspected vasculitis, your approach should be as follows. First of all, you want to uh, establish the diagnosis. So first of all, make the diagnosis that the patient in fact has a vasculitis. Secondly, you want to determine what the extent of the disease is. So you, as you'll see when we talk about some different vasculitic syndromes, some of them can involve multiple organs, okay? But they don't have to involve all of those organs. So you want to find out what the extent of the disease is. Uh, third, you want to look for uh, the uh, offending antigen or the underlying cause of disease if there is one so that it can be uh, treated or removed. How are you going to do all those things? You can take a history, you're going to do a physical exam, then you're going to do lab work. And the labs that are common, commonly employed in the, in the workup of, uh, of, of vasculitis include a CBC with a differential, a SED rate, maybe a C-reactive protein, renal function tests because vasculitides, especially the small vessel vasculitides, can often affect the kidneys because of the glomeruli, urinalysis because Again, a, a disorder in the kidneys uh, can produce an abnormal urinalysis, an active urinary sediment. You want to check for ANA or anti-nuclear antibody. You want to check for a rheumatoid factor. Anti-glomerular basement membrane. We'll talk about some of these uh, later on in, uh, in the course. Hepatitis B and C because sometimes the hepatitis can be associated with vasculitides. HIV, um, the chest x-ray, and maybe an arteriogram or a biopsy, uh, either a cutaneous biopsy or another type of biopsy if, if we're dealing with uh, a, a vasculitis that doesn't affect the skin. Then the vasculitic syndromes highlight some of the points um, on page 25. Temporal arteritis, uh, giant cell arteritis, and temporal arteritis is an, it's an important one to, to, to pay attention to because this is something that you commonly, well, you don't uncommonly see it in elderly patients. Uh, often they present with. Uh, with a headache, uh, and it's satisfying to make the diagnosis to, to, to figure out why they have a headache. Uh, and it's important to make the diagnosis because if it's untreated, they can develop visual loss, they can develop blindness. Uh, it can be associated with polymyalgia rheumatica, which is a, a syndrome that involves uh, pain and stiffness in the, in the hip and shoulder girdles. Okay. Again, you see this in elderly patients. You can have giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis without polymyalgia rheumatica, and you can have polymyalgia rheumatica without temporal arteritis, but they often go together. Okay. Uh, Takayasu's arteritis uh, was uh, described in 1905. You see it affects the aorta and its branches uh, and the pulmonary arteries. Um, it's more common in Asians. Uh, and the lesions, the lesions can be stenotic, 
occlusive or aneurysmal. By the way, I'm not telling you stuff just because I think this is the only stuff that's important. I'm trying to supplement. I think everything in the, in the, in the, the chapter is important. I'm just supplementing stuff that I think that they maybe should have told you, okay? So that so if you don't conclude that if I didn't, if I didn't say anything uh, about something that they're talking about, that I don't think it's important. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you repeat how the leak can go there and be stenotic? They can be stenotic, uh, they can be occlusive, or they can be aneurysmal. The lesions of Takayasu's arteritis. And what would you think of it? if you had, if I told you that uh, yeah, there was a patient that had Takayasu's arteritis who had developed, who never had hypertension and he developed hypertension, what would you think of? So you're talking just new onset hypertension. New onset hypertension. No. Well, there's a lots of causes of new onset hypertension, but what you should be thinking is, well, what is the mechanism by which Takayasu's arteritis can produce hypertension? And the mechanism is going to be a vascular, it's related to the renal vasculature, okay? If it produces renal artery stenosis, okay, the kidney will believe, the kidney will believe that it's not getting enough blood because it's not getting enough blood, right? If you make the renal artery stenotic, remember when we talked about hypotension, how the kidney responds to a decreased cardiac output in congestive heart failure, remember that? The kidney pumps up the production of renin, okay? So the patient develops hyperrenanemia. So if you have somebody that has Takayasu's arteritis who develops renal artery stenosis, that kidney is seeing a low perfusion pressure, and so that kidney, the one that's stenotic, produces renin, 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 and the patient's blood pressure goes up, okay? Okay, um, polyarteritis, polyarteritis nodosa. You see, by the way, that the different vasculitides are grouped according to the size of the vessels that are affected. You've got, small, you've got large vessel uh, vasculitides, medium vessel vasculitides, and then the small vessel vasculitides. So polyarteritis nodosa is a medium vessel vasculitis. It, it can present with abdominal angina. So these are patients that have basically a belly ache when they eat. Okay, the bowel is then forced to work. It's like asking the legs to walk. If you ask the bowel to work, uh, to digest something, uh, you're gonna produce uh, angina in, in, in a bowel that is ischemic. They can develop abdominal angina, and they're frequently associated with arteriographic aneurysms. So if you do, a, if you do an, uh, an arteriogram uh, of the abdomen in these patients, you can see little aneurysms uh, as a result of the uh, polyarteritis nodosa. And you notice that it, it is uh, possibly associated with hepatitis B, and this shows you uh, one of the reasons why you would check the uh, hepatitis status of uh, patients in whom you're considering the possibility of vasculitis. Kawasaki's disease is described in 1967. It's also referred to as the mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. It's called that because they can develop lymphadenopathy and peeling of the skin of the hands and feet, hence the name. It too is more common in Asians. And these patients can develop coronary artery aneurysms. The diagnosis is made clinically. And the, the cardiac complications are the most important. They can develop coronary artery vasculitis and coronary artery aneurysms. Uh, so that's the, that's the most significant uh, clinical aspect. Yeah. Um, as far as the aneurysms, the coronary aneurysms, could they not go in and um, like put someone into them? The coronary artery aneurysms? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how coronary artery aneurysms are managed in patients with Kawasaki's disease. I don't know, um, but uh, if I had some, well, these are, these are children by and large, okay? I don't see children, but uh, if I had somebody that, let's say, that slipped through the cracks and they got to me at an older age and it turned out that they had, that such a thing was, was uh, visualized, then I guess I would ask a, I would ask a cardiologist uh, or a cardiothoracic surgeon what the management is. Does anybody know anybody with Kawasaki's? Uh, yeah, go ahead. 
Okay, so what happened to him? Well, he is, he takes daily, like, antibiotics on morphine, and he has to take Crayola this time of year. Does he have coronary artery aneurysms? Yes. Yeah. He started out with seven of them. He's down to three. Okay, so you tell me then. What are you asking me for? What did they do for him? <laughs> <laughs> huh? So he does, he has coronary, uh, what do they monitor? Do they monitor the, these are small vessels. So right. what do they look for? Do they look for a particular size and then they do something about it? Yeah, um, I mean, I don't really know too much about it. I don't ask him a lot, a lot of questions, but he does, he's on anticoagulants, which is a cardiologist every year. They monitor the size of his aneurysms, the condition of his aneurysms, and um, I don't know, they haven't like done the same to fix yeah. it. I don't know. I mean, the thing, the first thing that comes to mind is that if they ever had to do something, I mean, they could always stent, right? They could, they could put a stent in or something like that. I would assume. I asked, because like, they, they, when he was younger, they offered his parents to go on heart transplant once. Because he started out with seven of them. Wow. But they didn't do that. And half of them resolved on their own. But he still has them. Okay. Can I ask you, is, is he Asian? He's not Asian. He's okay. Spanish, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so um, so that's Ka that's Kawasaki's disease. Uh, okay, the rest of the vasculitides are small vessel vasculitides. You did. Small vessel vasculitides, and we're going to uh, talk about a number of them. So uh, the first one is uh, is uh, Wegener's granulomatosis, which is which was described in 1936, and is and is uh, now referred to as midline granulomatosis. I don't know why they changed the name, but they did. So it's referred to as midline granulomatosis now. These patients uh, develop problems with the, uh, the, no the, uh, uh, the nose and the sinuses. They can develop nasal deformities, a saddle, saddle deformity. They have problems with the upper airways, pulmonary problems, and gl uh, glomerulonephritis. Because in the lungs, of course, you have small, small vessels. Uh, at the level of the uh, alveoli, and then the, the kidneys, of course, also uh, the, the glomeruli, the small vessels that are involved. Uh, the, the marker, the uh, biochemical marker for this is uh, uh, C-ANCA, or uh, cytoplasmic anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies. Uh, and <coughs> the clinical manifestations of wet wigan with granulomatosis, you're gonna suspect it in patients that have, again, the, the pulmonary, renal uh, disease at the same time, pulmonary and renal disease. There are other diseases that do it as well. Uh, they, these patients can develop epistaxis, which is a nosebleed, a saddle nose deformity. Um, uh, tracheal stenosis. They can have lung nodules. <coughs> Bless you. Uh, they can present with hemoptysis. It's not, that's not that uh, market. Hold on. This one's more market, okay? All right. Um, and uh, the glomerular nephritis can pro can progress to, to uh, chronic renal fatigue, okay? Sherb Strauss syndrome, another small vessel vasculitis. Uh, that is uh, associated, it presents clinically as asthma, okay? So this, you would suspect this in the patient that presents uh, with asthma. Uh, biochemical markers include uh, eosinophilia, peripheral eosinophilia, and uh, perinuclear ANCA, or P ANCA, P antineutrophil uh, cytoplasmic antibodies, which is uh, different than what you see in midline granulomatosis. Uh, Berger's disease, thrombo thromboangiitis obliterans, is basically a disease seen uh, only in smokers. Uh, it's the only effective treatment is smoking cessation for Berger's, uh, for Berger's disease. These patients uh, complain of claudication or rest pain in the feet and the hands. They can develop gangrene of the digits. 
And like I said, the only thing that you can do to help them is to uh, prevail upon them to stop smoking. And that was that disease was prescribed in 1908. So has this been seen in non-smokers? What's that? Has this ever been seen in non-smokers? Ever? Ever's a long time. <laughs> I think it's, I, as far as I know, it's almost uniformly seen. It's almost uniformly seen. Let's see, let's, let's, let's go ahead and see if it's ever been seen. Burger's disease in non-smokers. Burger's disease smoke cigarettes. Burger's disease can also occur to people who use other forms of tobacco, like chewing tobacco. Now, I don't know if it's ever been described. We'll have to do a more extensive search to see if it's ever been found in anybody who didn't chew or smoke. All right, but it's it's that's the that is the. Uh, well, I was just curious, like if they had, like what would they tell them? Well, I think you would. Well, I guess you tell them to start smoking and stop. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you would do is you would you would re you would rethink your diagnosis. You would think of something else. You would say, "This can't be right." You get you get a second opinion. <laughs> okay, but finally the last the last vasculitic syndrome is is HSP or Hanuksheinlein purpura. This is a, uh, a vasculitis that is, that is seen in children. It's associated with a, with a, a classic triad of, of purpuric rash, arthritis, and abdominal pain. Purpuric rash, arthritis, and abdominal pain. And these uh, children also have uh, uh, renal involvement. Spend some time thinking about these different things. You don't have to memorize stuff, but if, if, if later on, uh, if, if you remember, for example, that you know, Church Strauss is a vasculitis that presents with, among other things, symptoms of asthma, and Wegener's granulomatosis or midline granulomatosis, you know, there's that pulmonary renal axis. You'll see that also in good pasture syndrome, but a little bit different. So these are all things that'll help you later on. Okay? We're going to ask something. Yes. I just skipped over because I thought the treatment of it was 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 adequate. So I didn't have to add anything to that. Okay. All right. Oh. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay. Um, hypertension. This is uh, addressed. Uh, you, you can see that uh, this is addressed in this slide, which is I think number 28 in, in your in your handout. Okay, it gives you the different. Uh, it, this gives you the uh, the effects of systemic hypertension, uh, what it produces, uh, and how that can produce uh, clinical problems, including the development of heart failure, myocardial ischemia and infarction, <coughs> uh, hemorrhagic stroke, kidney failure. And retinopathy. Okay, so it, it gives you the, uh, the the pathophysiology for the development of some of the complications of hypertension. You remember that blood pressure is the product of cardiac output and total peripheral resistance, and cardiac output is itself the product of a heart rate and a stroke volume. Uh, you remember that um, hypertension can be either a primary or essential. 
or it can be secondary. And so I'm just going to spend just a little bit of time talking about uh, some of the uh, secondary causes of uh, hypertension. One of the things that they don't mention in the book, by the way, which is important to know, is that the, the most common cause, the most common cause of secondary hypertension, which means not essential hypertension, okay, is, is actually alcohol intake. Okay, alcohol is probably the most common cause of secondary essential uh, hypertension. But uh, some of the other causes, maybe more interesting, uh, include the development of, of renal disease. So as we, we've already referred to the fact that uh, patients that develop renal stenosis, for whatever reason, can develop uh, secondary hyperaldosteronism. Okay, so what happens is that they have, they have low uh, renal perfusion pressure, the kidney senses that, it increases the production of renin, which increases the production of angiotensin, uh, aldosterone, Aldosterone causes salt and water retention. Angiotensin causes uh, vascular uh, constriction. Then blood pressure goes up. Renal artery stenosis can be the result of a number of things, including uh, uh, fibrous, fibromuscular dysplasia. The book talks about that. It can be atherosclerosis, or it can be uh, it could be uh, 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 dissection that that occludes the lumen of the renal artery. It could be a vasculitis that causes a stenotic lesion. So. Uh, you need to think about the possibility of all of those things. Um, other causes of uh, secondary hypertension, adrenal causes of secondary hypertension. And remember, the, have you, you talked about the adrenal and physiology or anatomy? Okay, so you remember that the adrenal consists of both a cortex and a medulla. Okay, so cortical causes of secondary hypertension would include, the, the, do you remember that there's there's the, the different zones, right? You got the zone of glomerulosa is the one that produces uh, the uh, mineralocorticoids, right? You got the zona reticularis, I guess, which produces the sex steroids. And what's the other one? The zona fasciculata. Fasciculata, which produces the glucocorticoids. Okay, so patients can develop patients can develop um, hypertension from hyperaldosteronism primary hyperaldosteronism, okay? They can also develop uh, hyper, hypertension from, from overproduction of the glucocorticoids, okay? Because the glucocorticoids can have a mineralocorticoid effect. And if this disease of the adrenal medulla and they overproduce uh, uh, the catecholamines, so epinephrine or norepinephrine, they can develop a uh, hypertension uh, from that. You can also have uh, uh, hypertension associated with uh, vascular disease itself. So for example, uh, coarctation of the aorta, and we haven't talked about that yet, but we will. What happens with coarctation of the aorta, as you'll see later on, is that the narrow, the narrow the aortic lumen proximal to the renal arteries, what's gonna happen is that the renal arteries, the kidneys are gonna sense a decrease in cardiac output, they're gonna increase renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, blood pressure is going to go up. It's going to be very high proximal to the stenosis, and it's going to be low distal to the stenosis. So co coarctation of the aorta is another cause of uh, secondary hypertension. And then they list a few things uh, that I well, mentioned briefly. They mentioned hyperthyroidism. Um, I'm not sure how commonly this causes hyper hypertension, uh, but apparently it theoretically can be associated with systolic hypertension, but uh, I'm not sure how common that is. Um, Okay, so that's that's that. Uh, the consequences of hypertension, the book talks about, and you can see some of the consequences illustrated in this slide. Uh, in terms of the treatment, uh, on page 27, I'm not going to uh, uh, add anything except in the way of a clarification. So hydralazine, hydralazine, as you see, is mentioned in the middle of that paragraph. You should know that that dilates. Uh, primarily the arteries or the arterioles. It works on the, the arterial side of the circulation. Uh, the nitrates develop, uh, ar dilate arteries and veins. Uh, the calcium channel blockers dilate arterioles and uh, often, some of them decrease the heart rate 
and uh, they can decrease the stroke volume as well. It depends on which particular calcium channel you're talking about. So they can work on, on multiple arms of the blood pressure uh, calculation. <coughs> All right, cardiac inflammation, infection, and neoplasia. Uh, I am not going to add anything to that except in the way of a clarification. When they talk about uh, infective endocarditis, that it can be acute or subacute. Acute endocarditis is the kind of endocarditis that, for example, intravenous drug abusers develop, okay? Subacute uh, endocarditis, which uh, usually involves different organisms, uh, often comes from uh, 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 dental work, uh, uh, bacteremia associated with uh, a procedure such as uh, a dental procedure, and they can develop a subacute bacteria, bacterial endocarditis, and the infection is much more indolent. Um, they talk about uh, the different manifestations of, yes, somebody have a question? Somebody's question? Okay, they talked about the different manifestations of uh, endocarditis, and I do want to just uh, talk about, I don't know if you've, if you've talked about this yet in physical diagnosis, but I want to show you uh, These are uh, Osler's nodes, which can be seen in uh, endocarditis. They're painful. Uh, I have a good one there. They're related. These are these are Osler's nodes. They're, you see that they're, they're raised uh, and painful. You can have Janeway's lesions. Okay. Uh, the pathophysiology is a little bit different. One of them is uh, embolic in etiology. Uh, the other one is, uh, I believe, this is the one that's embolic, and this is the one that's autoimmune. Let me double check that. Um, okay. Patients can also have spew uh, Okay, uh, Osler's nose, painful, palpable erythematous lesions involving the pads of the fingers and toes caused by immune complexes. Okay, that's right. I said. And then the, the uh, Janeway's lesions, which are flat, uh, and they are, uh, uh, they are caused by septic emboli, okay? Uh, then they're not tender, okay? So uh, the other thing that you can see is you can see splinter hemorrhages in the fingernails. And the thing about, you see that? You see that there? Okay, they, they look like splinters under the nail, but they're hemorrhages. The thing about splinter hemorrhages is that, uh, hey, you see that? Doesn't that look like uh, endocarditis? <laughs> yeah, but, it's, uh, but these are terminal splinter hemorrhages. Like if you find them at the end of your nails, it usually means you hit yourself with, you know, with a hammer or something. But, if you, but the thing about endocarditis splinter hemorrhages is that they're not terminal, they're proximal, okay? So splinter hemorrhages, and you can also see uh, subconjunctival, subconjunctival hemorrhages, so if you pull their, 
if you pull their things down that, that you see you might see little pinpoint uh, you know petechiae or stuff like that uh, in the eye grounds um, and you can see you can see uh, ab abnormalities on the on the retinal exam as well so that can be seen in infective endocarditis on, on fundoscopic exams. So ulcers, nose, Janeway lesions, splinter hemorrhages, raw spots on, fund, on a fundoscopic exam. Um, in terms of their, their discussion at the bottom of page 27 of the treatment of infective endocarditis, they talk about the need for surgical replacement of the, the valve if the patient develops heart failure. Remember that if the, the bacteria are chewing up the valve, okay, uh, and if the valve is sufficiently consumed, depending on which valve it is, they can develop regurgitation of the valve, aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, pulmonic regurgitation, whatever. Um, and d depending on which valve it is uh, and, the, and, uh, and the severity of the regurgitation, the patient might develop heart failure from uh, volume overload. And so they're suggesting that surgical replacement might be necessary, but there are other indications for surgical intervention. And the other indications include, for example, an uncontrolled infection. So if these antibiotics are just not doing it, then it may be necessary uh, to go in and adopt a surgical approach. Uh, if the patient has an embolic episode and has a large and mobile residual vegetation, okay, so he is now thrown a clot to his brain or thrown a clot to his, to his kidneys or thrown a clot to the periphery, and you do an ultrasound and you see he's got other vegetations there that are big and flopping around, then you don't want to wait until he throws another, another embolism. That would be a second indication. Third indication would be a perivalvular infection. So if the patient develops a, an abscess in the myocardium, abscesses, uh, they require drainage, right? So surgical treatment. Uh, if the patient has a prosthetic valve, and it becomes infected, it has to come out. You can't medically cure prosthetic valve endocarditis. And then some organisms are difficult to treat medically, and so they, they require surgical treatment. So an example of that would be a fungal endocarditis. Oftentimes require surgical treatment. Uh, and the, the possibility of a myocardial abscess, a ring abscess, is one of the reasons why patients that have endocarditis are supposed to have, at least in the early stages of their management, an EKG every day to make sure that they're not developing a conduction defect, okay? So one of the reasons you do an EKG every day on a person with endocarditis is to make sure they're not developing, you know, first degree heart block, second degree heart block, third degree heart block, okay? Let's take uh, five minutes and then we'll come back and we'll finish the material.